healthy self-entitlement, self-agency, boundaries, self-care, managing stress. Um, and sometimes it's just a, a sit down with um, one of our Equus faculty or myself and ask us anything. Um, and we really mean <laughs> ask us anything. And we have a lot of fun with those. But we also like to use the space to share the mic and, uh, and, and bring guests on who represent um, members of our society who are the disenfranchised, the marginalized, who are the quieter voices um, in our community. Then they can share with the Equus community who they are, what they're about, and you can ask them anything. Um, we've had Thunder Bear Yates on our AMA, um, who's a dual member of the Nambe and Tusuke Puebla. Um, and he's our cultural educator here at Equus. Um, we've had um, we've had all kinds of wonderful guests. So we encourage you to keep tuning in to this um, uh, way that we love to just give back to our, our community. Um, tonight, we are going to be opening the uh, floor for all kinds of questions. No questions are too uh, silly or dumb. Um, just about you know uh, how to how to work with these holidays, and these are you know these are particularly stressful times now. On top of it, uh, on top of us rolling into the holidays, these are kind of post-COVID sort of times. Um, there's just a lot that is changing um, in our uh, social environment, um, a lot of tectonic shifts happening. And so it's a particularly interesting time for us all to be um, here on earth. And so we just want to assist you to have um, a more joyful time with whoever you choose to spend your time with over these next couple of months, two, three months. Um, and that's that's kind of it. Ram Charan, anything you want to share just on an introductory front there? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, Kali. Um, I think you covered it pretty well. You know, I, I would say a couple of things though about, you know, when we say surviving the holidays, it makes it sound like it's a horrible thing you have to get through. And, <laughs> and I just want to second that actually the, the, the purpose of this is to make it so that's enjoyable, but we know that there are challenges when we get together with family and friends, especially those who may have differences of political opinion or or different understanding of of our boundaries so um you know i'm no expert on this i've i've survived 55 years of holidays uh you know what what i'd like to do with people is you know offer some reflections on based on the assertiveness training we've been doing how that can be applied here because it's it's great um grist for the mill as as ramdas used to say this is this it's a really great opportunity for working through some stuff and and kind of um it's almost like um, it could be a final exam for people who've done the assertiveness for empaths course. Mm. So not that there is a final exam, it goes on, you know, unfolding. Um, that's one thing. And then also, you know, in, you mentioned interesting time to be on earth. One of the things that I find interesting is to shift to, I say almost an incarnational perspective around it, you know, to, to, to not stay so locked in the bubble of I am so-and-so and these are my relatives and these are my friends, but somehow to expand our sense of self um, it opens up different potential perspectives for how we can can relate to and frame our experiences and our relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that. It's true. So, um, in terms of how you will go about asking your questions, it's a small enough room. You can just raise your hand, or you can just unmute yourself um, and speak up and ask a question. You can also free to use the chat and, and Ram and I will keep an eye on the chat and you can ask a question or make a comment through the chat. We've had people send in questions in advance. Uh, so we'll be attending to some of those. Um, and uh, please, you know, we invite you to keep have your cameras on so we see who you are and, and can welcome you to the circle. If there's a lot of background noise going on, please mute your mic. But um, yeah, just really take up the space and and um, and claim your space here and 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 take from this time together what it is you want and you need for your for your life. So with that, we are going to uh, open the floor and um, and yes, go ahead. Hi, Marie. I just I don't know if you were raising your hand. Were you yes. raising your hand or just scratching my making head. a gesture, no, scratching your head? Okay. 
So we're just going to open up the floor. Um, we do have some questions that people have um, have uh, sent in, but uh, we want to start with those of you that have shown up in the room today. So we'll start there. Well, the question I have is, um, I very much appreciated, Kelly, your essay last week on silence, kairos, and taking space. And I wonder if you could just say a little more from that particular standpoint about well, apply it to the topic for tonight. Oh, great, thank you. So I'm gonna ask you a question first before I answer the question. What was it about silence and kairos and space that sort of called to you or resonated for you specifically? Um, well, it's been a long while, but you and I both took Otto's course on Theory U a few years yes. back. <laughs> and that, uh, and I had already done some training with those guys in Boston. And um, I'm convinced that somehow finding ways to go to connect with source is my vocabulary for that, that that is the, I don't know, that that summarizes all the other paths that I've studied and been on over the years and then goes beyond it because it's language that's more accessible to people than a lot of religious language today. Um, but I tend to forget, you know, I just sort of wander off in my little ego bubble <laughs> dealing with the HOA debates or you know, all these things that keep life throws in your path. Um, so this, you, you wrote it so clearly and, and succinctly, and I think you used um, vocabulary that sharpened it for me more than I'd thought of it before. Mm -hmm. You know how you think things over and over and then someone else says it oh that's what that meant mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's kind of that's kind of the general answer um but i realized that the sort of culturally scheduled stuff facing us in the, in the next little while will sort of override and toss us back into our default habits probably yes. without even realizing it a lot of times and so I, I just, as I dialed in today, I thought, you know, how, how to tailor make the idea of silence for the noisiest time of year, if you will, and how to think about Kairos the right time for all these things that are pre-scheduled again by the culture and how to think about you know, space is almost an antithetical concept to what the holidays create because they just take your entire life and then stuff thirty percent more into it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> right. I don't know if any anybody else feels like anxiety looming because of how much get starts to get stuffed and and also this sense of artificial emergency. Right, like we have to get it done before Christmas. Right, that starts to happen as well. Um, and. I, I, I will speak a little bit more about this and then I'll also um, invite Ron to share his thoughts too because space and silence is sort of his wheelhouse. Um, so one of my favorite sayings is opt out of consensus reality. And um, I, I do believe, and this is just my belief and if it if it resonates for you, terrific. If it doesn't, then then leave it. But the kind of haste and efficiency that that the world is starting to step into, not just during the holidays, but like in general, there's more emails that fit in an inbox now than ever before. There's, you know, a, technology is driving the speed of things. Um, and, and it's not necessarily the natural order of things. It's not, it's not, necessarily healthy for us it's just some sort of default speed that humanity has somehow decided to take um, and i think it can be a very radical act to decide deliberately not to buy into the haste the speed the 20 things to do in a day the um, have to buy so many presents you know for so many people um, and to, in fact, use this time to 
double down on your commitment to space and kairos and silence. Um, that, I mean, in a way, that's what the spirit of the holidays was about, right? Is about tuning into spirit. And, and the, the nature of spirit is kairos and silence and space. Um, I've, you know, I'm just throwing a bunch of thoughts out here, but I like to create alliances with the people that are around me and let them know that I am deliberately not buying presents this year, or I am deliberately taking um, a sabbatical time for two weeks. Uh, like Equus is closing its offices for the first time ever in December. Um, and let, and kind of call people in to a new way to do the holidays uh, as an invitation. Um, then it doesn't feel quite like I'm so isolated in that, you know, in that pull to honor those fidelities. Um, and I find too that in some ways, these headwinds that are pushing us to move faster and faster are also pushing us to become more resolute to our fidelities. And so I, I'm personally finding that I have to have more practices in my day um, that remind me of Kairos. I have, I um, like physical things that I do. Not, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Just walking out at night and looking at the stars will completely change my evening. And so to populate my day with as many moments where I reset and recalibrate and slow down um, is kind of my practice rather than having some big huge thing I do first thing in the morning for two hours it's sort of throughout the day a, a, a moment of pause and reorientation back to those truer things and then that sets me up for to slow be more slow in the next conversation or the next phone call um I also find it's really important to have allies in this. So Ram Charan is an ally of mine, right? In fact, when we got on the call before we let everybody in, I was moving a little bit fast because I had had a big day and he just, you know, he just said, seems like you've had a big day. <laughs> and it was a sweet way to kind of call me back into, yeah, this other way of being. So, you know, I've touched on a few things there. Um, Marie, I, I, I wonder if that's, you know, um, helpful, and then I'll pass it on to Ron. Whoops. You're I, muted. You're, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Ron Charn, you want any, you have anything to add there? A little bit. I mean, that was, that was really thorough. So thanks for that. Um, you know, I think I would just kind of expand on a couple of things you touched on. One is that holidays, holy days. This is, we're coming towards the, the um, winter solstice, winter, yeah, in the, in the Northern hemisphere. And, you know, a lot of this is, is, you know, the, all the myths surrounding that kind of going into the darkness and all the festivals of light are starting to happen. And, and that is a metaphor for how we can be in ourselves at this time of year to, to return to our root, to turn within. And, you know, in a way it is really, um, taking a stand against everything that is that is pulling you out of that natural tendency. Because I think that, you know, human consciousness on an individual and a collective level, there's a, a resistance to introversion, to diving within. There's something that doesn't want to do that. So we make social contracts and say, hey, let's fill up this empty time with lots of busyness and partying and socializing and eating and drinking and whatever to distract ourselves from what could be happening this time of year, which is you know, as you mentioned before, connecting with source. So part of it is, you know, question for oneself, which is more important and, and how do you want to navigate and find that balance? And then I, Kali, I love what you said about intentionally letting people know and saying, I am not going to be buying presents this year, or I'm, I will not, I'm not coming to that party because here's what's happening for me this year. That's, uh, that is modeling for them, I think, a more conscious way of, um, or a potentially more conscious way of approaching the holidays. Some people, it may really be like, oh my God, I want nothing more than to connect with my family. So, so do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, really about giving oneself permission to, to find your own balance and ask yourself the question, um, 
how do I want to be through this holiday season? And very often when we compromise our own best interest because we think that somebody else, it would hurt somebody else if, if we compromise our own needs, that is where both can get into trouble, both ourselves and the other person. So. Yeah, beautiful. Um, in fact, just today, somebody said to me, oh, we can get together over the holidays because it'll be much more spacious. It was a kind of businessy sort of thing. And I found myself saying, yeah, there'll be more space. And then I said, and I want to keep it that way. <laughs> Just because there's more space doesn't mean now I can fill it with a whole lot of coffees and lunches and things like that. Um, and it's so interesting how space, you know, everything wants to fill a void. That just seems to be a natural physics. So um, it's a great kind of um, a vigilance to keep um, around the holiday time. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Marie, just before we kind of pass it to the next person, is there anything that comes forward for you in light of what Ram shared or I shared? Um, or to pick up the word uh, vigilance, I think being vigilant to what our own best needs are is, <laughs> it's more of a challenge when there's more input coming from, uh -huh. you know, there, I suspect there'll be 20% more emails because more people will be trying to sell us things. Yes. And even Instagram, where I mostly just look at art, um, there'll be more other stuff being sold to me. And so noticing my own need to limit <laughs> things as simple as, I mean, even looking at art on Instagram is addictive. So mm -hmm. it all takes vigilance. Yes, it does. Especially and I'd like to, and I'd like to, maybe it may, it's just occurring to me um, from the three words in your essay that I started with, um, maybe vigilance has kind of a, I don't know, a prison guard aura about it. <laughs> Maybe there's a way of redefining vigilance as a happy thing to do instead of a brownie mm. thing. That just popped out in the top of my head. I love that idea, Marie. And um, I'd love to, I mean, I think of the word vigil, which is also a holy, to keep vigil, right? Which is a, there's conjures this image of a candle and light. And so, Many words have been hijacked by um, certain kind of ways of thought and mindsets. And, and to keep vigil um, is maybe a word that might feel more honoring for you. Or, yeah. or vig vigilness. Yes, vigilness, good. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be a vigilante. The, right. <laughs> the, one of the, one of the uh, teachings of the Buddha is translated. I mean, he was teaching in Pali, not in English. You know, he didn't speak English. So um, one of the things he said, and, and, you know, and this is from kind of very original teachings of the Buddha, is that, you know, during, during at least, during one of the three watches of the night, they would break up the night into three hour sections. Um, one who holds themselves dear should, should keep watch. That's the way he used it. Almost like um, as if meditation is maintaining a vigil of just keeping watch over oneself. So I think for, for me, that's always been a beautiful framing of what that vigilance is, because I agree with you often in spiritual teachings, we're told, be very vigilant. It's like, uh-oh, what's going to happen? But just <laughs> that quality of awakeness, maybe be, be awake. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Stay awake. And then the question is to awake to what? You know, that's what we're kind of talking about is what is it that connects you to source? So there's an, you know, that we can have these external strategies, how I'm going to navigate this, but then there's also that resting in our intuitive connection to source, which very often gives us um, a, a way to proceed spontaneously in the moment that's not coming from a mental strategy. Okay, all of you silent ones on the call. Who else yeah. has a question or That's sharing? Fun. It's a quiet group. Yeah, it's the silent night. It's the holidays. 
uh, Mian said, my connection is wonky. I'll sign off and enjoy the recording. Love seeing you all. Okay, Mian. Love Thank seeing you. you too. Yeah, bye, Mian. Okay, so I'm going to pull a, a question from uh, the write-in. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. We had quite a few come in. Um, uh, I usually enjoy the holiday times reconnecting with family and friends, but often feel low and drained after so much socializing. I'm wondering how to set limits for myself so I don't get set, get post-holiday blues. Mm. I'll hand that one to you, Ron, and I'll share too. Yeah. Um, you know, a simple one. I think sort of what we were talking about before is just that level of self-awareness so that one doesn't, maybe what, you can try experimenting with simple rules, like not to overcommit. Um, to recognize, are you saying yes to things that you'd rather say no to? Or when you're in the midst of one of these holiday parties or one of these, you know, things, at, at some point recognize, sense into your body. This is something I teach a lot. What is your body telling you about your need for more rest and space? And when you override that too much, I think, you know, after a certain age, we know that we know what the result of that's going to be is you crash. So, um, yeah, let me think anything else about that. I would really bring it back to body wisdom. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be part of the vigilance we were talking about before is, is, is very often I call the barometer of uh, the body a barometer of our psychic reality. It will tell us when we need more space. Very often, even in planning things, does that feel good or does it, is there something about it that, you know, giving me a sense I may be overextending myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kali, what do you think? Of that? Well, I love that you're talking about the body because the body really is such a great tuning fork for what feels right, what doesn't feel right. Um, you know, noticing that when someone invites you to <clears throat> a Thanksgiving dinner with their parents, that your stomach clenches just from getting the invite and that there is something about that that isn't feeling good. That may not mean that the answer is no. No is one answer. Um, yes, but with certain conditions is another answer. Yes, but I must leave early. Um, yes. Um, and I will only be dropping by briefly to give you all a hug. You know, there are all kinds of ways to, um, to say yes and no and everything in between. But to pay attention to these signals that the body gives us <clears throat> is, is just a great, is a great way to just have that barometer um, in our lives. Yeah. And a lot of times we, we really don't know in advance. I mean, at least, at least I don't. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I'm really not going to want to do that. And then the day comes, I'm like, actually, I do want to go. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, so just, um, to look at for what is the hook that that uh, tells us we have to commit one way or another for other people. You know, I understand if someone's planning a dinner party, they wanna know how many places to set, we do our best, but the, to see what is the hook that makes us override our own well-being uh, out of a social obligation. Uh -huh. and uh -huh. Is that really worth it? Uh -huh. um, there was something that you said about that. Um, Another way to respond is, you know, to buy yourself just a little bit of time. Can I let you know by tomorrow? Um, uh, oftentimes, I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll respond too quickly and I'll respond with a default rather than letting myself have, you know, 12 hours or something just to be with something before I really give an answer to it. So I'll often ask for time. Um, there, and then there's these kind of... Um, subcategories of boundaries that can show up during the holidays around uh, how we cope. So we'll say yes to something and then we may drink a little bit too much because of the social anxiety that we're experiencing. And so then it just kind of compounds on itself. Um, and, you know, how do we take care of ourselves so that we aren't cope? We aren't saying yes to things we want to say no to, and we aren't then coping with the scenario by drinking and eating a whole lot. Um, just so that we can survive it. So um, it, this is really about self-care and the permission to give yourself self-care um, and to listen to your body and what it has to tell you and, and, to, and to honor it and be willing to risk um, not holding it all together, not being like this person who can hold it all together, who's shining brightly and bestowing gracious gifts and hosting lavish dinners that, 
you actually get to, it's the winter season, you get to pull in, you get to crumble, you get to kind of, you know, uh, tend to some of the places in yourself that needed tending to. Here's another great question um, that I, <laughs> um, I have this uncle that always hugs me just a little too long. <laughs> I'm already anxious about it. It feels, I feel like punching him. What can I do instead? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this is, you know, holidays are, it can be a time when, you know, all the relatives are there and there are just some relatives who have different proclivities that can be uncomfortable. One good thing for you to do is to plan in advance. Don't wait until the moment to decide what you're going to do. If you know you're going home for Christmas or, um, or you're going home for Thanksgiving and you know that Uncle Joe is gonna be there, start thinking about what you're going to do when his very predictable behavior starts. And there are things you can do, like, for example, when he starts to come towards you, you can move your body sideways and just kind of do a little quick hug. Um, or you can have, have be ready with a plate of hors d'oeuvres and hand him the hors d'oeuvres. Like there's all kinds of ways that you can graciously set physical boundaries for yourself that don't have to mean that you have to make a scene um, or, you know, be the complete downer of the evening, but you can still take care of yourself. Um, but strategize ahead of time. You know the ones who are going to be sucking on your energy. You know the ones who are going to be pulling you in for a conversation about gossip about some other member of the family. You know the ones who are going to be um, boundary invaders. And I would suggest getting a journal out marking down these people and really thinking about some very specific strategies so that when they come and they do that thing, you're ready with, you know, I'm just not going to talk about that right now, but hey, I really love your dress, you know, <laughs> um, and there's a ton, there's a ton of material out there um, in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, what to say, how to say it. Um, we in our uh, upcoming in, in our class, assertiveness for empaths, we have this whole like sheet of one liners that are just perfect for different scenarios. And I think we'll be doing that in our loving your limits class. But yeah, strategize in advance. What about you, Ramcharan? What would you say? Yeah, well, I like everything you just said a lot. Um, I would add to it. Do a what's OK, what's not OK kind of worksheet mm -hmm. on it. You know, you can really, you can really see your different levels of limits. And if something is triggering one to the point where you, you want to punch someone, that's a pretty clear sign that that is a hard boundary you have to set. Um, and that's good to recognize those things. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't think, that, I think that um, the, um, particularly around physical space violations, that's, that's a non-negotiable, should be a non-negotiable. Uh, there are others that are maybe a bit more like negotiable, you know, okay, a minute of, you know, blah, blah about somebody, whatever your comfort level is. But um, just to, 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 again, like you suggested, if there are people who you know are going to trigger you or suspect are going to trigger you or who there's been problematic relationships with in the past, just do that. Write it down a bit, the behaviors and see your comfort level with each one. And then like, you know, Kali, like you said, just think of how you want to manage it. Uh, there is a great quote about boundaries and uh, about the definition of boundaries. Mm. And it is, um, a boundary is the point at which I begin to lose myself. Mm. The point at which I begin to lose myself. So boundaries aren't this like hard, you know, steel wall, immovable, you know, perpetual kind of fortress. Boundaries are very organic and depend on context and, and you in that moment and what's happening. So it's about, again, to go back to what Marie was uh, speaking about, um, a vigil, being attentive to where in every moment are you about to lose yourself? Um, 
can happen in a conversation, can happen in a decision you're about to make, can happen in some appointment that you thought you wanted to do, but now you've changed your mind. So just pay attention to that line where you start to lose yourself. And that's where a boundary can be drawn, which may be um, something that you set with another and maybe just something, a guideline that you set with yourself. I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Um, yeah, also, you know, I, I just want to mention that there is a, it's not just about, you know, strategies for behavior, but there's an, ener an energetic component to this. Energetic meaning, uh, like, you know, Marie, you started us off with mentioning connection to source. When, typically, when one is in that space, the energy you are putting out makes it much, um, it will change other people's, way, the way that they perceive you and very often the way that they relate to you. So rather than, if there's somebody who pisses you off because, you know, some distant family, some cousin who, who wants to gossip about something that happened when your kid, whatever it is, something irritates, if you can stay in a space, I find of, I'm really connected to source. I've got the bigger picture happening here. Yeah, I don't really want to talk about this stuff, but I'm not setting up this hard energetic block against this person. They typically will not feel that um, I'm rejecting them. And so they won't keep coming at me as much to try to get some juice. If I just sit there and, okay, I'm not going to engage with that, but I'm also going to um, allow myself to appreciate this other human being who wants connection just as much as I do and doesn't know how to do it in a way that's appropriate to me, just to hold that space of possibility, but not the possibility for them to, um, how to say, take over, uh, do psychically draining stuff, all that, but still there's this balance. We talk about in the course, we talk about the aperture of empathy. So it's not an either or um, situation there. You can, you can learn how to narrow it a bit, uh, bring your, pull your energy in, and you're still from the place of connection, you're offering them that. But you're not wide open and offering them you know, that you're gonna be a dumping ground for their garbage. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go to any other that have been sent in, anybody have any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> I do, Kelly, but it's really, it's about the horses, and it may not be on the topic that you set this meeting up for. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I like that. That already uh, teaches me something. <laughs> I've been doing like 10 years of elder cat care without a break. And I've got one that's, you know, heading for the portal right now. And um, mm. I'm very touched that you have horses because I can't even, well, actually I can begin to glimpse what it might be like to lose a horse. And I just feel like you have a really big heart. And so what I'm interested in, how do I, I have a pretty big heart. It needs to get bigger. So that's, how do you handle it? And what is the wisdom that you have or the, um, from you or Uncle Bob or mm -hmm. horses? So my first question to you, Lola, is um, how do you know you have to have a bigger heart? How do you know that? What makes you say that? Well, I can hardly stand it. You know, I'm really, it's really hard. And I lost a very sweet beloved kitty in January and she made it to be 20. I had a long life with her and this is also an older kitty. But I just, I guess I just, you know, I do feel like I'm a kind of a midwife for both portals, although I'm not a licensed midwife, but I studied midwifery a long time. And it just, I don't know, I just feel like I need a bigger heart. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to suggest that it's not a bigger heart that you need. And, and how this ties back to um, everybody else who's on the call and, and the surviving the holidays is that um, part of, <laughs> part of uh, our understanding what we, what we are, 
what we are what we are authentically willing to do in the world has to do with being willing to feel and mm -hmm. feel all the huge emotions that move through our body our, culturally we're taught to numb and squash and silence and make and diminish emotions and feelings and so we don't listen to ourselves and we and we bypass important information that comes in the form of sensations which we then call emotions but really they're just sensations the more that you feel i would argue lola the more the bigger the heart you have so it's not that you need a bigger heart but to cultivate a capacity to feel that it does hurt to lose somebody it just does it hurts it's not gonna not hurt and to love hurts um to set a boundary with somebody that we care about hurts and is uncomfortable for example just to deviate a little from from your cat but all those sensations are uncomfortable and so my uh suggestion is that for all of us is that instead of being in that layer of emotion that says this is sadness this is anger this is frustration this is you know ang whatever joy happiness is to drop down into a sensation level where sensations are merely either pleasant or unpleasant that's it that's that's the deal they're not going to hurt you they don't feel good but they're not going to like destroy you so and just be with the sensation as is just it's it's a weather pattern in coming into your body that as a natural weather pattern that happens when you care about something and mm -hmm. it's it's a big hurricane or sometimes it's a little storm or sometimes it's a sunny day but it doesn't matter it's all this isn't about turning a hurricane into a tiny little you know spring shower this is about being with the sensations as is and yes they hurt and the more you step out of the story of the what the emotions tell us like this is grief and i don't and i i can barely stand it and therefore my heart needs to be bigger which just causes you a lot of trouble <laughs> just be with the sensations and the you know the the pounding in the chest, the jaggedness in the throat, the clenching at the stomach, just be with it as is. Like right now, can you just be with the sensations that are coming up for you right now without any need to label them as grief or horror or despair, just be with them. Yeah. Like that. That's having a big heart. Thank you. So, and thank you, Lola, because being with our sensations as is allows us to have capacity. And when we have capacity, we're less triggered by our emotions and we can make much wiser decisions um, during the holidays and during any other time. And as you're with your cat and he goes through this change, being deeply present with the sensations that arise allows you to be deeply present with him. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm. Ram, anything you would add? In my experience, grief is a um, opening to grief without a story is a great way to come closer to God. Yeah, that makes sense. We don't. We resist it because it, it, it is, it's unpleasant sensations, but actually I've worked with the meditation at times when, when in a bereavement phase where I actually breathe into the heart as if, well, it says it's the heart had nostrils. I know it's not the, the, the prettiest image, but actually be with that center in here that feels pain, see the minds wanting to rework the story to avoid the pain and just detach from the story. Very much this, the, the grief very much is about the story. So um, grief transforms us and it transforms itself when we're able to be really, like Kali said, be out of the story, be totally present with the sensation to the point where you actually go into it. It takes a bit of time and focus and, and clear intention, but it's, um, 
it comes bearing profound gifts in my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I really, I grok what you're saying. So it helps me know, okay, this is where I need to work. This is where I need to let go, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I've been, I, I spent some years in primal therapy and, mm -hmm. and you're just in it. It, it. There's no label. There's no thinking. You're just in it. Yeah. And I find sort of apropos, Kelly, of what you've talked about, about highly sensitive people who narrow their worlds. Okay. So I would say I had a very big world at that time in a lot of ways. And there were ways I was still like fucked up. Let's just be honest here. Sorry to use my French. Um, but I have since, I don't know, it's been a bunch of times since I came up here and I came back to New Mexico from Denmark and I had so much sensitivity going and, and I was shamed for it. And mm -hmm. um, I have shut down some of my, sensitivity so I am hearing this and I want it regenerated and expanded and um yeah beautiful that's a be that's a beautiful brave courageous thing and that is the key to being present and living as presence and that's a really powerful thing Lola yeah and that whole story about you needing to have a bigger heart like can leave that one behind. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, your, it's, your big heart, it's your big heart that's saying that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people people who would shame somebody for being sensitive are typically very afraid of their feelings. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Why else? No. Yeah. And this is why uh, Ram Charan and I engaged in this work. Um, with um, the loving your limits and assertiveness training for empaths is because we saw sensitivity as a, as a superpower. It's and really, it's our biological birthright. We're born sensitive. We're, you know, the natural world is highly sensitive. Um, uh, animals that have survived millions and millions and millions of years are among the most sensitive, and so um, we endeavor to empower that as a superpower rather than something that makes us want to shrink and hide and collapse and get small. Um, so, so terrific. Great question, Lola. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? We have, oh my gosh, the time flies with these things. We have about, yeah, we have about, mm, yeah, five or seven minutes. Um, so those of you who are on the call, this is your chance. We have other questions lined up, but we'd rather talk with you live. So be brave. Okay, I'm gonna grab a question. Um, I set boundaries with my family members, but they pressure me, tease me and challenge me when I do it. So what can I do? So this is something we learn about um, in the classes and courses that we do, and it's called tribal shaming. Um, tribal shaming is just very briefly, um, our, our most primitive part of our brain is still here. It's in the kind of base uh, of the brain and it's, you know, was the first part of the brain to form in our prehistory. And it learned by, well, we survived by being inside a tribal context. If somebody left the tribe, it meant certain annihilation for the person who left the tribe. And it also meant danger for the tribe because each person mattered. If somebody left the tribe, we, perhaps we lost our shaman or perhaps we lost the person who collected seeds or the person who was the midwife. And so it's threatening. That part of our brain is still with us. And when somebody departs from the familial code of conduct say then it activates people that you're leaving the tribe this is not conscious this is very subconscious 
And so they will do what's called tribal shaming to bring you back, to shame you out of leaving, leaving the family uh, dynamic. When you set boundaries or start to operate by your own rules, it'll come across as teasing or badgering and but even can be as hostile as disownment you know that also happens um it's a time when we're most susceptible to sabotaging ourselves because we too get afraid that we're leaving our tribe so we may feel real clear about the boundaries we're setting but there's a part of our brain that's going hang on there's some saber-toothed tigers out here and i'm going to be all alone and i'm going to die and so People will tease us and cajole us or badger us and we'll we'll sabotage ourselves and go back. So it's important to see it at work. And sometimes these tribal shaming tactics can be quite subtle, like, um, oh, gosh, you're just so busy. You know, (laughs) that's tribal shaming. Um, Gee, you look so tired since you took on that new job. That's tribal shaming. Uh, So. So just watch that, understand no one really means to do it necessarily. And there's a part of their brain that's really scared and threatened by the fact that you are departing from the family code. And um, and once you kind of see it for what it is, it'll have less a hold on you. You want to add anything to that, Ramcharan? Yeah, I was just kind of reflecting on this phenomenon of tribal shaming while you're speaking. And, and, you know, it occurs to me that, that if you look at groups, groupthink, um, you know, it's really common. It's a religious, political, uh, social, cultural, blah, 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 that people, um, very often people are unsure of who they are and what their, whether their beliefs are true. So if they can get more people to believe what I believe, then I will feel more secure that my beliefs are true because other people are telling me that. It, I just want to point out like a very accessible psychological understanding of that phenomenon. And so when someone steps out of that agreement, it freaks people out. That's basically what's happening. So, um, you know, for the person stepping out, I think it's about, you know, really um, coming back to opt out of consensus reality, to thine own self be true. It's, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to leave the tribal group, but you're there because you choose to be there, not because you've, you've given up your sense of, um, of your autonomy. There's a different way that you start to show up, and that is best for everybody. It's best for the person who's showing up. And actually, when you show up in your power like that or walk away, whatever it is, you're creating an example for other people. Look, you don't have to buy into this whole agreement, which is keeping us all small. So there's there's actually a great gift in breaking the tribal agreement, even though, again, it freaks people out because fear of the unknown. God, if if I have less, uh, what's the word, validation or reinforcement that my beliefs are true than what is real, that's what gets triggered on the psychological level, fear of the unknown, uh, uh, unsureness of self. So again, I think like you said beautifully, be aware of that dynamic, that's what's happening. How do you wanna show up in that? It can be very interesting and fertile ground for shifting a lot of things. Hmm. Super, do we have time for any more questions or are we? A very brief one, a very, very brief question. Jeff, any questions? <laughs> Jeff, we're calling on you. <laughs> I have no questions. Um, I'm just here to be supportive and you know be part of the fan club. But something that came up to me just as you were just talking, Ram Sharan, was that um, a wise counselor has told me to stop stepping back. Um, and I've been working on that for almost a year now. And one of the things that occurred to me as you were talking about changing behaviors and being an example is that often I find myself being protective of who I'm with in a situation, right? I'm like hypersensitive, just, you know, hypothetical example, right? Like if I'm with my wife, Amy, and I sense that she's feeling tired, I'm hyper protective and sensitive there, and then trying to leave because of that. And what what came up for me there is, I can practice owning that maybe it's me ready to go. Mm-hmm. And I've spent so much time um, in a codependent frame of thought, I guess, that being aware of that is, is, is at least for me, it's empowering. It's like, no, I'm allowed to be the one that's ready to go or whatever. Yeah. 
That's great. Um, so I did, that wasn't really a question. It was just something that came up for me that hopefully will be useful super for, some, for, for future someone as they watch the replay. So. Well, super interesting. Also, if you are aware that she is feeling tired and you so you decide to go, that's also for you. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there's marriage and self-preservation for one, but, <laughs> yeah. but also, but no, I, I think that's totally right. But I just think part of it is, you know, I've, I've spent many years um, putting kids or other, others first, and I'm still, I'm still relearning how to think that it's okay for me to uh, want to, want to do something, or it's okay for me to say, no, actually it's burrito night or whatever. So. Right. Yeah. I love that you shared that, Jeff. And also there's this, besides codependency that can be at work, there's this thing that, um, uh, oh gosh, what is her name? Uh, she's a couples therapist and I can't remember her name just now, but, um, and she wrote the book Mating in Captivity. And uh, the couples will split the paradox. So if you're, you're the one, you know, one is always the one that needs to go first. And that way you don't have to be the one that needs to go. Right. Right. And so couples will often split, you know, one is messy so the other can be tidy, you know, but really there's a way that we disown parts of ourselves so that that person can carry it. Um, and so it's very healthy when you start to say, hey, I can take that piece too. I get to be tired. You know, I get to be introverted tonight. So. Yeah. Terrific. Close relationship and marriage in particular is very interesting because in a, in a very real sense, your, your, your frontal lobes function as auxiliary uh, function frontal lobes for each other. So you there's a very much of an entwining of nervous systems there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very deep topic to explore. You know, we're just, it's kind of interesting. We can't really go dive into it now, but um, yeah, that's why I saved it for the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we wouldn't have to go into it. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's, it's, it's Esther, it's Esther Perel, by the way. Esther oh. Perel. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, so here's here's what we're going to do. Um, Ram Charan and I do not like the hard sell with things. So any of you on our call tonight that don't want the hard sell, you can you can hop off right now. No harm, no foul. But we do have a really special offer just for those of you who are on this call right now. Um, th those of you who have shown up. So if you'd like to know what that is, we want to share that with you. We have in November, uh, what's the date? Do you remember, Ron Charan? Um, 19th, Saturday the 19th. Saturday the 19th, a class called Loving Your Limits. It's a three-hour class. It is a hybrid uh, mini version of our very amazing Assertiveness for Empaths course. Um, and if you email us by midnight Friday night, you can have it ha be in the class at 50% off, which means you could be in the class for $45. It's a $90 class. You get to be in the class for $45. So, so that's a deal. Hour. Three hours. Um, so that, what, say it again, Ron Charn? Three, three hour class. Three hour class, yes. And uh, so what I'm going to do is put in the chat um, loving your limits. And I'm going to put the link in there for you too, so you can learn more about the class. Um, there it is. And there is an email address, address called connect at equusinspired.com. If you email that email address by midnight tonight and just say in the subject line, I was at the AMA, <laughs> uh, then you will get your 50% off in the, uh, in for that class. Um, those of you that have been in the assertiveness training for empaths, this is a great review. And, um, and one other offer we want to make is that we have our upcoming assertiveness training for empaths starting in March, 2023. If you write to us by midnight Friday night, you can have that course, 14 week course for 20% off, which is quite a savings. So we hope you'll jump on it. Uh, don't hesitate. And um, we look forward to all of you um, joining us. And um, one of our faculty members uh, named Kate Eskew, um, actually she's a faculty in training. She does family balancing for the holidays. It's a kind of like remote feng shui balancing energy thing that I haven't experienced yet, but I hear it's amazing. And if you would like to try that on for size, I'm just going to give you her email address. You can reach out to her. So you have three choices there, and we hope to see you at the Loving Your Limits. Anything you want to add, Ramcharan? I think you covered it really well, and I'm just um, 
thankful for our conversation today. This was really interesting. I just want to say I would love to attend this class, and I have a program that I'm in that already has that weekend, so I'm sorry. I will miss it, but I will take a look at the uh, the next empath course. I would really like to do that, and I still want to come and work with the horses. All that, all that's going to happen, Lola. Yay. Yeah, it is. And um, and we'll probably be doing loving your limits again, but it won't happen until towards you know middle or end of 2023. So mm -hmm. this is this is the moment to seize the seize the day. And, Perfect. Uh, we'll, thank we, you, everybody, for we joining pay, us. If we pay for it, can we get a recording? No, it's not going to be like that, right? Or the loving it, your limits. Yeah. Uh, if you pay for it, you can get the recording. Absolutely. Absolutely, you can. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Terrific. Thanks. Great, great question. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we'll let you go. Enjoy your holiday season. May it be spacious. Yes, hugs. May it be spacious. May it be peaceful. May it be easy and filled with grace. Namaste. Bye-bye. Namaste.